All right, I have a little presentation um, just to go along with my face here. <laughs> so I can also just say next slide when um, if that's helpful for you, Matt. Yeah, let me get a different chair here. It's the wrong screen, except in the wrong spot. Chris, did you have another introduction that I well that you could do that? Uh, yeah, you know, all I wanted to say was that as a new member of the Social Justice Committee, uh, I, I want to just introduce Megan as uh, a guest of the SJC. We on the Social Justice Committee strive to make a presentation available to this meeting every quarter uh, to just help enlighten and enliven our neighbors. Uh, the SJC has a mission and vision statement. In brief, we are committed to the right of every human being to live free from discrimination. We respect the right of all people to a healthy environment. We will work with residents and local institutions to build a safer and more inclusive future for all inhabitants of our neighborhood. And uh, we are proud to host Megan, who will represent Mobility International USA, which is uh, an organization dedicated to advancing disability rights and inclusion around the world. Awesome. Thank you Thank very you. much for that introduction. Um, so uh, I'm Megan, I'm a program specialist at Mobility International USA, also uh, MyUSA for short, and we are a nonprofit organization based in Eugene, but we work all over internationally. Um, our mission, I guess we can move on to the next slide actually. So just to give a brief, I only have a little bit of time with you today, so I'm going to try my best to keep it short and sweet. Um, but today's presentation, I'll share a little overview of our organization and some ways that some of you might be interested in um, being involved in some of our programs that are coming up. And then I've been asked to focus specifically on mobility disabilities today and um, how to be more inclusive of people with disabilities that might affect mobility in your community. And my disclaimer is that in a perfect world, somebody with lived experience having a mobility-related disability would be here presenting to you. Um, but I, I assure you that everything I'm sharing, I've learned directly from the people that we work with in our programs. Um, and then we'll share a little bit about some of the challenges that they may face in your community. But more importantly, what we like to do at MyUSA is really share the solutions and some actions that you can take. Um, so we can go right ahead to the next slide. So MyUSA's mission is to empower people with disabilities to achieve their human rights through international exchange and international development. Um, I'll explain the photos on the screen as well. So we are a disability-led organization, meaning our leadership and most of our staff and board members are people with disabilities. So that's something that will come up a lot. I really encourage as you're taking this journey to be more inclusive um, of all different kinds of people, all different kinds of disability representation, um, to really try when you can to learn directly from people with disabilities, as they are the experts, of course. So we do international development projects. We might work, if we receive a grant, for example, we might partner with a disability-led organization in another country, and they will tell us what they need to advance the disability rights movement to get more inclusion in their communities, and we support them with whatever that might be. It could be technical assistance, it could be connecting them with resources or people um, giving advice, those kinds of things. And then we have exchange programs, which is what I wanna share briefly about before diving into the main subject for today. So on screen, I have a photo of three of our different exchange programs. The first one is our Women's Institute on Leadership and Disability, um, WILD for short. And this is a program, this is one of our signature programs and I'll share briefly more about this on the next slide. Um, this is one that you might be interested in um, being a part of when it happens again. The second photo, so in the first photo, we have women with different kinds of disabilities from around the world actually river rafting um, here in Eugene. The second photo is one of our young youth exchange participants who is blind and she's riding a bike. Um, and that's part of our annual youth exchange here in Eugene. And then the third photo um, was from a program that we had here uh, just last month. We had a group of delegates from Vietnam who were here on a study tour about the processes and systems and government and schools and employment to be more supportive of people with disabilities. 
and they're standing in front of a mural that Lisa has on the side of the Palace Bakery uh, in downtown Eugene. I'll go on to the next slide. So very briefly, the wild program. This is a photo of our 2022, a few of our 2022 women. Um, this program, we bring in 25 women with different disabilities from 25 different countries to Eugene for a three-week leadership workshop. And these are all women who are leading the disability rights movement in their countries. And they come here for an intensive workshop on really learning everything from health, education, employment. And we also do empowerment activities. So everyone will ride a bike and go rafting. And we go to the Spencer Butte Challenge course and climb in the trees. Um, but one really cool thing about this program is all of these women will stay with the host family in Eugene. And uh, actually, a few of our host families are part of the Santa Clara community. And so you might know some of them. Um, and so this is a really great opportunity to really learn directly from people with disabilities, from people of a different culture, a different religion. It's a really impactful part of the program. So our next wild program is, we don't have dates yet, but should be in 2025. Um, so I'll make sure to share host family information if that's something you might be interested in. Um, it's always a really wonderful, long lasting relationship. How long does it last? It's three weeks. Yeah, and you don't have to commit to hosting. I don't want to talk too much about it today, but you don't have to commit to hosting for three weeks. We usually have um, a full three week session or a kind of first half, second half, and in the middle, we go on a little camping trip. So, <laughs> so there are options um, for hosting, but keep that in mind if it's something you might be interested in. All right, I'm going to move on now to the topic of the day. I'm going to be mindful of my time. So I do want to preface that there are so many disabilities that can affect mobility. And today I'm just going to briefly give some examples and then some challenges that every person is different. Um, and so your learning should continue after, even after today. Um, but some disabilities that can affect mobility are visible. So you might see someone using a wheelchair, um, power wheelchair, a manual wheelchair. There are ambulatory wheelchair users, so people that use a wheelchair sometimes but not all the time. Um, we have people using assistive devices, walkers, canes, crutches, braces. Um, but there's also a lot of people with disabilities that are not apparent. So you wouldn't notice by looking at someone that they might have challenge with their mobility. And that could be anything. There's a variety of um, conditions and disabilities that can affect mobility and it can affect coordination and balance. Um, some in, includes people of short stature, so different types of dwarfism. Um, and then there's also age-related physical changes and then people with chronic illness or injuries, whether they're permanent or um, temporary injuries that you want to consider when you're looking at accessibility. Um, and also important to note that some disabilities can change over time. So progression of different conditions or sometimes there's environmental triggers, the weather can change things lots of factors in life that affect all of us um, but in particular if you're someone with a disability that affects mobility there are a lot of things that can change over time we can move on to the next slide so i want to share some challenges or barriers that somebody might face and this is not an exhaustive list but i thought we would um, focus a little bit on what barriers someone might experience in their daily life navigating around their neighborhood, um, the stores and businesses in the Santa Clara community. This is not specific to Santa Clara, specific to everywhere, but um, but just as you all know your community better than I do, just be thinking about some of these things that might exist. And on screen is one of our wild women actually, who uses a power wheelchair and she's crossing the street in downtown Eugene. And I like this photo because she's in a same crosswalk and there's a curb cut um, right at the end there, which are two important things we'll talk about. Can move on to the next slide. So one category of barriers um, could be environmental barriers. So this could be things like uneven terrain. So if there's a park or an establishment that's only on grass or there's wood chips or just uneven roads or pavements. Um, one that I see a lot all around Eugene are sidewalks that are kind of eroding, overgrowing, uh, overgrown. And so I actually have a photo on the next slide. You can, you can move to the next slide of a lot of things that maybe if you're someone without a disability, you might not even recognize as you're walking down the sidewalk that that could be either really difficult or impossible for somebody with a disability to navigate. Um, another thing I notice a lot is sometimes in driveways, a car will park blocking the sidewalk. 
And again, if you don't have a disability, you might just say, oh, that's annoying, but you'll hop off the side, off the curb and walk around the car and get back on. But for somebody using an assistive device or not, somebody with a disability, um, it's not, they might not physically be able to get off the curb. And so then they've got to go all the way back to wherever there is a curb cut, if there is a curb cut. And it might not always be cars. It could be after a storm, a uh, tree branch in the way. It could be a child's bicycle. It could be a garbage can. Um, there's so many things that could block the path. And so I encourage you to be thinking about some of those barriers there. I'm not sure in some of your communities, there might be, sometimes there are light lampposts or mailboxes also that might not fully block the sidewalk, but are enough that someone using a wide wheelchair or a wide walker um, might have difficulty navigating. Um, next, we can go to the next slide. So another barrier, seasonal weather. So we talked a little bit about how weather can affect somebody, the presentation of someone's disability, um, but also navigating ice and snow in this time of year, it can be very challenging for people with mobility disabilities. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention is the lack of crosswalks. So some people with disability, with mobility disabilities, might move a little bit slower. And so if there is not a safe spot to cross the street in a, a slower manner, um, that can be really dangerous and um, can really limit what, how, where someone might want to travel independently if there's not a safe place to cross the street. Um, the ice and snow, I think about one of my neighbors, I live in an apartment complex and um, he, he uses a power wheelchair and he lives in an ADA accessible apartment and he can get from his apartment to the parking lot to his car. Um, but one, one year it snowed and the parking lot was paved and some of the sidewalks were paved, but the path from his door to the parking lot was not paved um, or not shoveled. And our apartment complex didn't have a shovel and none of us had a shovel. And so he went in and if for, for us that don't have disabilities, we can put on our boots and kind of trudge over the snow and get where you need to go. But for somebody again with a disability, it can go, it can be either really difficult or impossible um, to navigate those situations. So we ended up using pots and pans together from, from his apartment and we shoveled a pathway because none of us had a shovel. Um, but that's something to consider just the hills and the ice and the snow that could be a barrier to someone. Um, and extreme heat again can impact some disabilities. We'll move on to the next slide. Social engagement is another big one. Um, so thinking about the access to your neighbors. So if I wanted to talk to my neighbor, I had a something I needed to borrow from my neighbor, I can walk up, knock on the door, ring the doorbell. Um, but a lot of homes in Eugene, um, and I'm assuming in the Santa Clara community as well, a lot of apartment complexes, there are steps, or even if it's a small step or some stairs where your neighbors with mobility disabilities might not be able to just go knock on your door or ring your doorbell. So that's something to consider when we talk about solutions. Um, I'll, I'll share some solutions for that, but making sure that your neighbors have a way of communicating with each other. Um, and again, not just your neighbors with disabilities or without disabilities, but, but everyone has multiple ways of being able to communicate and, and ask for support. Um, inaccessible event locations is, is another one. I think I'll talk about that in, in the next slide. So you can go ahead to the next slide. So this is just some examples. Um, on the right, I don't know if you can quite see this photo, but on the right hand, there's a parking lot. There's a little step, but beyond that step is another little step. And this is, this is actually my apartment complex. <laughs> um, I did not take that photo, but that kind of shows this small barrier where it's just a couple inches, but it is completely blocks off access for neighbors with mobility disabilities to be able to talk to each other without another solution. Um, and then the one on the left is maybe you have neighbors or family members visiting who don't use a device or maybe can walk up one or two stairs, but there's no railing here. And that could be a really big barrier as well. Um, and of course, it's not just limited to homes. I, this is also businesses and um, parks and anything you can, can think of in your community as well. But there are barriers that you might not think about um, unless you're experiencing them. You can move on to the next slide. So I think this is the, the last challenge slide um, I'll share, but one thing that I like to use the term or ask myself if something's functionally accessible. 
So a lot of times in my work at my USA, and I also um, work for the city of Eugene's adaptive recreation program. So many days I'm calling up venues or looking them up online to see if they're ADA compliant. And a lot of venues are, um, now the ADA has been around for a long time and legally buildings need to be compliant, but that's kind of the floor of, of accessibility. So a lot of times a place will say it's ADA compliant, but when I go up, when I show up and do a site visit and walk through the room, the furniture is too close to, like you can't navigate. Um, and that's something that I really encourage when we talk about solutions as well as when you're having meetings and events to make sure that you're not just taking someone's word that it's accessible, but to really go and look at the, at the place. And there's a lot to accessibility. It's not just ramps um, or railings, but also thinking, for example, people of short stature, thinking about if there are stools available um, to reach some of the tables and sinks or someone's using a wheelchair and all of your snacks and drinks are on a really tall table that they can't reach themselves. Um, that can put a barrier to participation. And a lot of times events, if they don't say that they are accessible, <clears throat> I've heard from the disability community that oftentimes they might assume that something's not accessible and it hasn't, people haven't checked for accessibility unless it's explicitly said it on the event flyer or the committee meeting invitation. Um, so that's something we'll talk about in, on the next slide as well. So now most important, um, I picked just five actions to be more inclusive. This photo on the screen are two of our wild women. Again, one uses a power scooter and one's using a manual wheelchair. They're at the University of Oregon campus. You can go to the next slide. So one solution is to make sure that you're offering ways for all of your neighbors to communicate with each other somehow. That's not just um, if you need something from your neighbor, having to knock on the door but also making sure that if, if there are ways for you to um, have avenues of having neighbors be able to ask for support and not just offering that support to the neighbors that you perceive have a physical disability. But for example, if you know there's a snowstorm coming, which unfortunately there's no snow in the forecast, mm. um, but if, if you know that's coming, um, how can you make it comfortable for neighbors to ask for help if they think they might need that? and not make it feel like you're just asking that one person that has a disability in that house down the street, but how can neighbors, there are a lot of reasons you might need support with shoveling your sidewalk or your driveway. And so trying to think about creative ways that people can communicate that with each other. Um, next point. So maybe that you're hosting events in wheelchair accessible spaces. And again, kind of just talked about this. So making sure that it's functionally accessible. Whenever possible, of course, it's good to get feedback from people with disabilities. Um, but if you don't know anyone with a disability or you don't have anyone with a disability on your committee or you're the one going to check the venue um, or the business or wherever you're going, um, just thinking about how would I navigate this if I was sitting down or how would I navigate this if I had to make this tight turn in a wheelchair. Move on. I also just mentioned this, making sure that you clearly communicate that events will be accessible and offering a channel of communication for people to request accommodations. And this is really important because it shows that you want people with disabilities at your events, in your businesses, at your committee meetings, um, and not just will have it in an accessible location if someone with a disability shows up, but that you are going to have it there no matter what. And again, a lot of people benefit from accommodations that maybe are designed for people with disabilities, but are, are universally liked and accepted and used by a lot of people. Um, so if someone pushing a stroller, or if you're wheeling in all of your technology equipment into a meeting, having a place that you can do that, it will benefit everybody. And it really shows the disability community that you are serious about being inclusive and, and you want their perspective. I think there's two more. Um, next is advocating for reduction of barriers. If you walk into a new pizza shop and there's no accessible entrance, um, you can you can ask them about that. You can advocate to local community officials and and really request that it, it is the law to be accessible. And um, we've we've done that quite a bit. Our CEO Susan Siegel has done a lot of advocating in the aging community when she walks into or rolls into a business. She's a wheelchair rider. Um, and it's not accessible. 
And so really holding your community accountable and not necessarily waiting for the barrier to be a barrier before you address it. And then the last one, last one is including people with disabilities in all of your committees and, and anything neighborhood related. Really, if you are taking these actions, I, I would bet that you'll have people with disabilities who want to participate. And once you remove those barriers, um, they will participate and your community and your neighborhood will be better for it. So. I think that's my last slide. Might have taken a little longer than intended, but um, yeah. And I thank you all for really being um, really proactive in inclusion. And I understand you've already heard from uh, other organizations in different disability categories. So I just applaud your efforts. And yeah, thank you for having me here. And I'll open up. I don't know if there's time for questions or discussion, yeah. but okay. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Yeah, we should have 15 minutes or so for discussion or questions. Uh, I just want to mention that I belong to another group, uh, Eugene Neighbors Inc., which uh, advocates for neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and we have an annual meeting. The meeting this this uh, year dealt with the sidewalks, uh, which is called where the sidewalk ends, and and, uh, and the, the whole issue of uh, failing sidewalk, especially in the south region of Eugene. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that, that interested me was uh, a presentation uh, by uh, uh, one of those people in South Eugene that, uh, that was called Make Way Day. And Make Way Day was uh, adopted from an English uh, program in England. And, and one day, and I, I can't remember what date it was, but one day is designated for all the neighbors, the, the neighbors go out and trim all of the, the, the vegetation that's overgrowing the sidewalk all the way along. And she showed, showed a lot of pictures about that. And you don't think about that, but boy, you know, if you were in a military, you had to try, you try to, to, to navigate around some, some of those, some of those things. That yeah. Really, yeah. So that was interesting. Awesome, that's nice to hear. I hadn't heard that, so definitely following up with that. Are there creative solutions for sharing the roadway? Because in Santa Clara and River Road neighborhoods, we have a lot of streets that don't have any sidewalks, and they're yeah. county, county rural roads. And you know, we have a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists, and we, for the most part, use them together. But are there? So we're always looking for. Uh, other examples of yeah. ways to not have to build a sidewalk, but to make it safe for everybody. Like yeah, that. I think um, signs are always helpful. I know when I'm a driver driving through a community, if I see a sign telling me to slow down or there's kids here or people crossing, um, at least I will pay attention to that. I hope that all drivers will. I think signs can be helpful and kind of talking about cutting back the vegetation as well, trying to really minimize the the barriers that could be potentially hiding a pedestrian for a driver to be, if they're driving by and there's a tree kind of in the roadway a little bit, just their visibility, I guess I'm, I'm not finding the wrong words, but um, yeah, kind of trimming the vegetation, making sure that drivers have the maximum visibility. I think without putting in, it, it is challenging. I think that's a challenge that a lot of communities in Eugene have is, finding a way to share the roadway safely. If there's opportunities to put in more lighting, that can be helpful as well. Um, but I, I would really encourage signs, even if they're the signs on, on your front lawn, please slow down. I think it can be really beneficial. For example, one of my colleagues and I were going to a food truck and she uses a wheelchair and the food truck was in a parking lot and there was a speed bump there. And it was really, really, really challenging to get over that speed bump. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have sidewalks and you're sharing the roadway, sometimes speed bumps can actually be challenging for people using wheelchairs, walkers. Um, but I think the more and the more you can educate neighbors, really, education can go a long way. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, if you don't know somebody with a disability in your life, you don't think, you might not think about it. But if, if we can continue the education, uh, you have people, you have neighbors with disabilities here, and you need to be watching out. Um, there's kids in your community, you need to be watching out for them. There's people walking and biking, you need to be watching out for them. 
I think those are some of the, the best solutions without basically putting in a sidewalk or a light or a crosswalk that I can think of. And, and you might come up with great solutions as well. Yeah. Terry, and then I have a question, and then Mary, we want to make sure Go ahead, Terry. Thanks, Matt, and and thanks, Megan. That was uh, a lot of great information. Um, just just in general, to be a better neighbor, I'm thinking, oh man, I want to send texts to all my neighbors and saying, if you need anything, reach out. You know, cup of sugar or whatever, <laughs> whatever simple things. But I was wondering, um, do you offer maybe advice or counsel if um, there are community events that will be planned? Just um, you know, not to not to, you know, overextend your bandwidth, but just to to say, hey, this, you know, these are some things that you might want to think about, or is that on your website? Uh, what can you tell me about that? Website has a lot of resources. Um, so you can probably find all that on the website. Although we have so many resources, it could be overwhelming. <laughs> um, so I, I'm happy to share my contact info. And if you like, I would be happy to share. These are some of the things when we're looking at venues that we look at. Um, that's something that I can for sure commit to um, without anyone else from my organization here. Um, but we do we do have a lot of resources and we're always happy to point our, our neighbors and our community to the appropriate resources. Um, but I'm certainly happy to share my contact and we work across disability. So when we're looking at accessibility, we're thinking about physical access, but also access for people who are blind or access for people with autism. Um, so we're happy to share uh, anything that we can. And again, the best advice you're gonna get is from having more people with disabilities in your community, in your committees, in your meetings. But when you don't have them, we're happy to share those resources. Thank you. All right. Um, my question was on the uh, funding and how it's determined where you mentioned sidewalk cuts. And then you also had a picture of sidewalks that were broken. And I know that in our, uh, especially in the neighborhood I live in, it's a 60s era yeah. uh, neighborhood and the sidewalks are pretty atrocious. But we have had a couple of sidewalk cuts put in um, at times. So I'm wondering how that funding mechanism, is there, uh, do neighbors just report it as being a problem or are the city and county, county engineers looking at it? And is there a way to tell them like, hey, if you guys are gonna be working here, that chunk of sidewalk, you either need to grout over that giant crack or it's gotta go too. Yeah, um, that I don't know for sure. That's a little outside of my expertise, but I know when we see something, we usually will just continue saying, this is a problem, this is a problem. Just report it to the um, city. Just county. report it, yeah, I keep reporting it. And they they are pretty, I think they, they try as much as they can to address those, those problems. But I would say report it if you see it. Um, I mean, if you have creative solutions that you can do as a neighborhood before the city gets to it, that can be really helpful as well. And then Mary had in the chat, it's kind of the same lines. Does the city and or county have an office that deals with ADA compliance? Oh, that is a great question. They so we just at our in our last exchange meeting, we were just talking about this. Um, uh, with some city officials and I don't know for sure that there's someone specifically looking at ADA compliance, um, but they do, they told, they kind of share that they try to weave it into everything that they're doing, but they really rely on the community to point out when something is not ADA compliant. So I would say again, just reporting anything you see that's not ADA compliant can be really helpful. Uh, but I don't know for sure. I can find out the answer to that and, and share with you. I have a question. Um, can I be a host to someone from an international corporate? Yes, I can have Yeah, that's actually a great question. So uh, I have big stairs, but I have three or four stairs up to my to the porch for my front porch. Yes. So we know that not a lot of houses are accessible so we kind of when we're working with host families we will prioritize the women that we know that are coming that absolutely 100 percent need a fully accessible house and we have some host families um, that are people with disabilities or that have an accessible house mm -hmm. but a lot of our our women coming have different disabilities that might not require an accessible house so we have women that are blind or women that are deaf um, some women might be like i mentioned ambulatory wheelchair users where they might use their wheelchair all the time, but when they get to your house, they might be able to walk up one or two steps. Really depends on the person. Right. 
Um, but yes, the short answer is yes. So I will make sure you get that information. Yeah, I have a friend who did that it. That is a great question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have a friend who did it and she loved it. So it was absolutely Yeah, great. it's a really it's experience. wonderful experience. Awesome. You have people coming from all these different countries uh, to come on and visit the United States. I wonder what their feedback was when they come to the United States. How are we doing in general for accessibility here in this country compared to the countries that they're coming? A lot of the women that we or just in general, all of our programs, we are working with people coming from countries that accessibility is really far behind where the U.S. is. Um, one day, our goal is that they'll all be even better than we are here and we'll learn from them. Um, but a lot of times people are very, it, it's a different experience, a different life experience. A lot of the countries that we're, our women are coming from um, might not even have paved roads or they might not have access to a wheelchair or a walker or a cane. Um, some of them do, it really is a wide range, but a lot, sometimes even just the automatic door is, is new information, where for us that's pretty, we've had that for a while, um, but some countries are are getting close. So it's it's been nice to see, at least in my time at Mesa, but there's lots of work to be done uh, around the world for sure. And Eugene actually is one of the more, it is a model of accessibility. And I'm sure as now, maybe you'll be thinking about disability as you navigate your community, you'll see that we are nowhere near perfect. Um, and we're a model for this, for accessibility. So there's a lot, uh, a lot to do, but Eugene, it really does work really hard at being accessible and um, really is kind of a leader in the area, but we can still do a whole lot more to be accessible. I just want to mention too that I've done a lot of foreign travel and and, uh, and I can't imagine that people with disabilities could do the traveling that I did. Uh, there, there, most places there's you know, there's stairs everywhere. I mean, and, and sometimes you get tired climbing stairs, uh, uh, just just visiting tourist sites and stuff. And, and so it seems to me like if you had a disability, it'd be a, a a really limiting experience in terms of, of trying to travel. Yeah. It can be challenging for a lot of the women that travel here for our programs. Um, they have never traveled before. They've never been on an airplane. Uh, but one of our goals with this program is to really help them feel empowered to find solutions to accessibility so they can go back home and advocate for that. And we guide them along the way of We'll connect them with people who have traveled and share. This is how you need to you know, make sure your wheelchair doesn't get damaged, um, which is really unfortunately a big problem. Um, but also there we can request airport assistance for them. So if someone can meet them at their gate and help get them to the next gate and we communicate with them the whole way. So it is difficult, but it's possible. And hopefully eventually years down the road, it will be much, much easier for people to travel. The website is miusa.org. And there's lots of resources and tip sheets. Um, if you meet a neighbor with a disability who wants to travel abroad, we have tip sheets for that as well. And so there's lots of lots on there. Um, we are a cross disability organization, so um, we have tips for every kind of access that you might be interested in learning more about. Great. Thanks very much.